Okay, let me go. Let me go get on so I can let people. I tried lines outside to say come through the phone call. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I am, but it is so much better than being bored. I appreciate it. Hello, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Got a few minutes. We're a little early. Enjoy your coffees. Good and strong. <laughs> Natalie, how's your day? Call? What's that? Busy day today. Yeah, it is going to be a busy day. Yeah. Started yeah. with a bar mitzvah family, and I'm going the other direction. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
unfortunately. Circle of life. Yep. How's your dog? My dog is good. Getting older, a little more cranky. Um, at the same time, a little more fat. So it's all good. 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 Good morning. <clears throat> so who is love life? No, so, no. There's Melissa. Well, I just... so who is love life? I see somebody has signed on as love life. I just want to get a sense of who that is. How are you? Does everybody have a printed handouts? Good. Yes. Okay. No, no, no. I, we sent we send them out. Oh, that's right. All right. I'm, next week, I'll try to remember to make extra copies too. You certainly do. Hmm. Right, exactly. That's true. Book your toes. Book or. And a beautiful and a beautiful day it is. Uh, are you officiating? Yeah, yeah. Cantor, are you officiating at the cats and unveiling? The cats and unveiling, and then um, Shirley Hager's funeral. Okay. Both. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep, 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 yep. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Bye. <clears throat> Nomi, how are you? Well, Nomi, I'm good. Oh, thanks. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, everybody. How cold uh, is it out there? It's lovely out here. Good. It's not cold. It's just a lovely fall day. Good. Colors are changing, getting beautiful. Uh, They're still changing in Toronto? I thought it would have already happened. Under Nomi. There, yeah, the more north you go, they're already changed, but here they're still changing. Oh, it's kind of late today. Because usually by now they're changing in Boston and gone where you are. Yeah. 
Right, we're gonna wait about another minute or two, give people a chance. Turned it off because it was too cool. Just a reminder to everybody to have the materials if you have them, please. I don't know why I'm only getting eight people on my screen instead of every. Yeah. Do it this way. Yes. Now I've got twelve. Yep. But I disappear. Let's see what we can do. Now. Are you three? All right. Good morning, everybody. So a couple, um, a couple uh, business stuff related pieces of information. Number one is that we meet again next week. Then just because of a series of, of events, et cetera, we have one meeting in, in November, three in December, three in January, three in February. All right. So just watch the calendar. So we meet next week and then November 14th. And then we pick up again in, in January, in, my, in December rather. And I apologize, but you know, I'm doing six things and Sunday mornings are a little nuts. So not, on the not on the 7th, right. Not on the 31st, not on the 7th. Yeah, I'm going trick or treating. Um, That's right. Too many carbs. That's <laughs> All right, so uh, last week, Last week we left off, we, we kind of set the stage for the Jews coming to America. And now I want to talk a little bit about life in the country as itself. We're Jews. And so education of the young was a major concern for the colonial parents. The leaders of Sheriff Israel in New York establish a school. And in 1746, they publish a list of regulations, which stated that the school hours were from 9 to 12 in the morning two to five in the afternoon every single day, English reading, writing, and general uh, literature were taught. And of course, Jewish topics were taught as well as in any Jewish day school. It was sort of a different world in a number of ways. They were a little more educated. Yeah, you know, I remember reading a report that said 100 years ago, parents would say, I got the Jewish education of my kids, go send them to school so they could learn and be Americans. Today, you have a sort of a reversal of that process. You know, today, it's I got there, I can, I'll deal with their American citizenship, make Jews out of them. That's a reversal of a trend. So schools were open. The second thing, cemeteries were established. You had a consecrated burial ground for the dead in New York. Was, the cemetery was established in 1655. In Philadelphia, the synagogue was established in 1740. And what you have are Jewish patriots from the Revolutionary War buried in, in Philadelphia and Sheriff Israel, Yeshua Israel in Newport City, other places such as Charleston and, and uh, Savannah. So Jewish war veterans from the Revolutionary War are buried in Jewish cemeteries around the country. The Judaism that was being lived was unique. It really, the Jews of American life insisted on creating their own American forms of Jewish observance. Clearly something we understand because it, for us, it's just a normal pattern. That wasn't the way it existed in Europe. Being Jewish in early, in early America was a form of compromise, a form of creativity. And also remember that the earliest settlers, they, they came from Brazil, came with a memory of forced conversions, and therefore they weren't terribly well educated. They didn't go to schools because they couldn't go to schools. And so this group of people that came to America were not the most well-educated Jews on the planet. They brought with them their Sephardic customs, and as I said to you last week, the, the Ashkenazim who followed initially bought into it and said, we will go along. Um, and although the Ashkenazim realized they were well-educated, so in certain ways, they looked askance at what the Sephardic Jews were doing. Nonetheless, most of the time, most of the time they went along. That's not to say that there weren't any squabbles. 
All right. If you look in 19, look at reading number one. This is from 1739. It is written by a minister to a friend in Germany about the Savannah Jews, and it said, "They have no synagogue, which is their own fault. The one element hindering the other in this regard. The German Jews believe themselves entitled to build a synagogue and are willing to allow the Spanish Jews to use it with them in common." The latter, however, reject any such arrangement and demand the preference for themselves. So there were squabbles. Let's not paint a picture perfect, but as a relative, as a relative rule, the Ashkenazim and Sephardim got along as well at that point as they, as they ever have. As a matter of fact, you have intermarriage. Ashkenazic Jews are marrying Sephardic Jews and vice versa. It's inevitable because there aren't very many Jews from which to choose. All right, you kind of go with the flow. Of greater danger to the, this small community was intermarriage out of the faith. Freedom in the new world also meant freedom to choose and the casual relationship <laughs> between, uh, between uh, practitioners of different religions. They could get together in social settings and it led to conversion, it led to intermarriage. And so the long con Jews long constrained by civil and religious authorities in Europe were quick to throw a lot of that off and it had consequences along the way. Except for an occasional visiting rabbi, there were no permanent fully trained rabbis in America until the 1840s. This was not necessarily perceived as dif different from, outside, from the outside world because only one out of four Christian congregations in New York, for example, enjoyed a full-time pastor until 1750. And so it was the pattern of the world to be lay led. In many of the Jewish congregations, what you'll hear is they were led by Chazanim. They were led by local cantors who didn't necessarily have the halachic background but could lead the services and keep people going and attending. So at first, as I mentioned last week, Congregation Shares Israel is really the first fully functioning congregation, views itself as having a universal mission of governing all Jews within its reach. And until 1825, it was the only Jewish house of worship in the city, and it provided religious and educational services to what is a small Jewish population. As you know, Jewish populations, however, quickly subdivide and we find new ways, new congregations. The ultimate power of this congregation, however, was the power, as I mentioned last week, of the cherem, of excommunication. The, the principal means of defining social deviance and of removing from the community its wayward members whose actions and behaviors offended the general values. If this person was treated, if you were put in cherem, you were treated as if you were dead. No business dealings, no social relationships. You were outside of the Jewish community. Now, while in Europe, that worked. Because in Europe, the Christian community wouldn't accept you either. So now you had no business opportunities. You had no place to go. You were literally in trouble. In America, that wasn't the case. The freedom allowed people to interact outside the Jewish community. And so the whole concept of harem really fell on its face. It didn't work here. More often, as we talked about, punishments consisted of fines, denial of honors, and then ultimately the worst thing you could do is deny somebody burial in the Jewish cemetery. Yes, Bill. Now, when I was in the military, I met a lot of guys from the South. All right, I'll repeat the, I'll repeat the comment in just a second. And they were goldsmiths. They were all kinds of seemingly Jewish names. So you met a number of people from the South when during your military years who had seemingly Jewish names. And were not Jewish. But were not Jewish. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't know the source of that. I, I don't know. I'll bet they were Smiths, not, not Steens. Yes, they were Smiths. All right, so because a goldsmith is a profession. So that's a possibility. Okay, I was a guess on my part. I got it right, I got it right. There we go. The, 
the 18th century began a time of separation of religion and, and general life, compartmentalization. Synagogue communities for the first time did not tax commercial transactions. They didn't censor what Jews wrote on the outside of the synagogue world, or for the most part, punish members for their lapses in their individual or business morality. In Europe, that did happen. Instead, like their neighboring churches, the synagogue community confined their activities to those, those within their own sphere. They might discipline someone who is religiously uh, wayward and, and with fines and loss of privileges, but civil, but civil and commercial activities, uh, even when they pitted one Jew against another, were let, were let off to the municipal authorities. Again, we take that for granted. That is not the way that European life works. This is brand new. And that, com that compartmentalization was symbolized by the Toro Synagogue built in 1763. The outside of the building, if you were to walk past this building, you would have no idea that it is a Jewish building. It sort of reminds me, you think of, of, of Fenway Park. You could walk past Fenway Park on the outside and not know there's, there's, a, there's a ballpark there. But go inside of the, of the synagogue, and it is full of Jewish items and Jewish symbols. The social club founded by the Newport Jews in 1761 similarly reflects that compartmentalization. Conversations relating to synagogue affairs was, if not totally prohibited, severely regulated within the portals of the club. So you are not allowed in the social situation to speak about the religious and, and the synagogue life. The very essence of such an institution, this, this social club was a place, it was a place for low stakes card playing, supper and imbibing, all right? Indicates that Jews lived bifurcated lives. They, they complete with rules and institutions and customs that kept synagogue life and general life in separate areas of their worlds. Sounds neat. The reality of it is, it's not. The problem for early American Jews with the central Jewish observances, if you were to define what are the core basic elements of Jewish observance, they are kashrut, they are Shabbat, they are festivals. Those are the core elements of Jewish practice. And each of these blurred the boundaries. The engendered painful conflicts between the demands of Jewish law and the norms of the larger society. So, for example, if you were to refuse to work on Shabbat, okay, that meant because of blue laws, which also prevented you from working on Sunday, you had a five day business, plain and simple. All right, running a business with no weekends of any sort, as well you can imagine, is not a good business model. Observance of Kashrut made travel away from home and social interactions outside of Jewish homes difficult and awkward. One of the, uh, one of the uh, intentions of Kashrut in its earliest stages when it was practiced in Europe was to prevent those kinds of social interactions with non-Jews. It was meant, and by the way, Christians did the same thing, it was two-sided but it was meant to prevent interactions between the different religions. You didn't eat or drink with those of another religion because that's where our primary social behaviors occur, all right? Another area of distinction with the Jews in this time, of this time was the diversity of nation of origin. The 1790 US census recorded that Jews in America had been born in England, in France, Germany, Holland, Poland, Portugal, the West Indies, as well as those who had now been become, were born here in America. And as a result, the most striking feature of Jewish life in the colonial period was its diversity. Within every community, even within individual families, you would find a full gamut of religious observances and attitudes from deep piety to total indifference. Again, I need to emphasize, for we look at that in our world today and say, of course. I mean, which of our families doesn't have that range, 
All right, which of our communities doesn't have that range? That is new within the American, American experience. Other factors which also drove the diversity was the lack of rabbinic leadership. You didn't have the scholars and the lack of general Jewish knowledge. And so if the knowledge range is so different, so are gonna be the practices. As a matter of fact, the religious education of congregants in general was quite low. Again, we're looking at its time, but it prompted Isaac Pinto in 1765 to translate a prayer book, a Hebrew prayer book into English. That was unheard of. It was unheard of. Of course you knew how to dive them. Of course you knew the Hebrew. Times they, they change. This diversity translated as well into congregational life. Sheriff Israel was providing help to other congregations, but they quickly realized they had no influence. We would give you money, but each congregation was going to do its own thing. Judaism developed along staunchly congregational lives. All right, each had its, and even within the congregation, it was all over the place. Now, again, we, we, I can't think of a congregation more diverse than Brith Shalom. All right, the rabbi and I've had this conversation many times. We have everything from those who are just to the right of UOS who just can't quite get over that line and sit here because they want, they want egalitarianism, but in every other way sort of would feel comfortable there, to a synagogue, that, a reconstruction, a synagogue that closed down and that membership came here. That range sits here in this sanctuary on a weekly basis and says, deal with my issues. It's, very, it's a great challenge. It's, it, and this is what the world of America has been all along. You would not have found that. If you go into New York, every third block is another synagogue. They don't have those issues, all right? They don't have that range of behavior within. And so although Sephardic, in, the, in their time, Sephardic ritual was the norm for the established synagogues at the time, friction began to develop, hi Rachel, develop between the Ashkenazim and the Sephardim. And in 1802, we have our first group of Ashkenazim withdraw from Philadelphia's congregation Mikvah Israel, 1802, to establish a new congregation, which they call, and I hope you remember what I said last week, Rodef Shalom. All right, pursuers of peace. This turning point marked the transition from single entity Jewish communities to the multi-centered world that has characterized American Jewish life ever since. All right, that, that's the division, but there are still some unifying principles. For all of the diversity that has characterized colonial American Jews, there are two bedrock principles which have kept us together in general. One, Jewish peoplehood, and two, a belief in one God. Those are principles that extend beyond that enable some sense of, of, of community. Peoplehood obligated Jews to assist Jews throughout the world and set them apart from everybody else. We're going to reach out to those Jews in trouble. The second principle, particularly in the colonial period, but even today to some extent, the principle of one God essentially communicates that we are going to reject Jesus and the Holy Spirit. One of the ways people define themselves as Jews is that, is that we are not Christians. Okay? I just had a class on conservative Judaism and with the teenagers, and I asked them, you know, same thing within our movements. I said, what makes a conservative Jew? And their answer was, well, it's not reforming, it's not, not orthodox. Right. What makes a Jew? Well, he's not a Christian. So one of the defining elements is what we're not. Despite this, the private beliefs, the practices that determine and define colonial Jews religiously and distinguish them, social act interactions in trade, on the street, wherever Jews and Christians did gather, inevitably blurred the distinctions. The majority of American Jews resided in religiously pluralistic communities, 
with people of diverse backgrounds and diverse faith, including many who themselves had experienced religious persecutions. Again, if you remember the colonial times was a time of Protestant specific. And if you weren't in my Protestant group, we have no use for you. If you were, God forbid, a Catholic, oh my God, there's no place for you. Jews kind of actually had it a little better than the Catholics, all right? <clears throat> And as a result, American Jews felt more comfortable interacting with Christians than Jews anywhere else in the world. It was just a place of, of overall, over, um, overall acceptance. From the very beginning of Jewish settlements, therefore, Jews and Christians also fell in love and they got married. This was an alarming problem for Jews who seek to maintain an identity in the face of living in the midst of a larger Christian world. Somebody in Israel gets intermarried and it's not a, it's not a tragedy because Jewish identity is not gonna be lost in Israel. Here, it, it, was, it wasn't in certain ways still is far more difficult, but it's also a sign. And this is critical, it's a sign of Jewish acceptance, particularly since the Jewish partner was not required to convert to intermarry into the Christian world. It was saying that the Christian world was accepting us for the first time. That didn't happen in Europe. You couldn't get, you couldn't intermarry without converting. The problems that this raises, both for Christian and for Jews, for Christians and for Jews, is that Judaism, even more so than Christianity, is designed by its very nature to govern all aspects of life, not just the religious sphere, all right? Judaism is not a faith. It never has been. All right, I'll take any questions at this point before we go into the revolution. All right, Talmud says silence is agreement. Uh, Martin, oh, Katie, just a comment about what you just said, which I think is kind of important because it's playing itself out in the recent Pew surveys and so forth. And that is that the notion that Judaism is a religion like Christianity, like Islam is just wrong. Mm -hmm. There is not even a word for the word religion in Hebrew. It doesn't have a word for religion. So let me repeat it so people here can hear what you just said. Um, the, it, it, this, what I just said about it, not being a faith is, is evidenced by the Pew Report, which has just come out. It, we don't fit into a nice, neat little package like Christianity or Islam, where it's just a religion. There isn't even a word in Jewish tradition for religion. We, we, how we define ourselves goes everything from peoplehood to well, religion. The word, to, the word, you can be, I have a, a, a friend, a dear friend who ha, just got her doctorate in Jewish education, who has absolutely no belief in God. None. Zero. That doesn't disqualify her. Yeah, you know, in the Christian world, that would be a problem. All right. Yeah, Joyce, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Let's look at the revolution. The momentous events of the revolutionary era transformed America into a society built on individual entitlement rather than corporate identities. You as an individual have value outside of your identification with a group. And in its emphasis on freedom of expression, the United States had be becomes a society based on consent rather than descent. Rather than who your families and your background are, do you opt in? That's a change. These changes served to transform the Jews whose forebearers had been Europe, Europe, Europe's pariahs. By definition in Europe, it didn't matter who you were because you were in this group, we hate you. In America, it had to do with who you as an individual are. We may still hate you, but we may hate you because of you, not because of your group. Big difference, or we might love you too. The role of Jews in, in leading up to the American Revolution is largely unrecognized, given the fact that they represented only a small portion percent of the overall population. The vast majority of Americans had never encountered a Jew other than the pages of the Bible, and most likely had no idea there were Jews or Jewish communities in America. They had no clue. Those Jews who are here 
were sharply divided along the lines of Tory and Patriot. Okay, just like everything else. You know, today we're Republicans and Democrats, they were Tories and Patriots. Many Jews actually vacillated and ple pledged allegiance to both sides in the dispute as long as they could. We know historically we have supported oftentimes the very wrong outcome and it's come back to bite us. And so the, the, the community at large, by the way, was also doing this. People didn't want to make commitments. And so the Jews followed their lead. Constant to, at that point, they constituted less than one tenth of 1% 1 of the population. And so the best bet is just echo what the people around you are saying. You aren't going to have enough influence. Nativity, ties to Europe and economic factors really were the issues of that determined loyalty. Some were Tories, they were British loyalists. The Hart family of Newport seemed united in its loyalty to England. Aaron Hart, like many of the Tories, he relocated to Canada rather than confront the Patriots' hatred of him in his community. We're talking about within the Jewish community. So you have Jews who are running out of the States because of hatred by other Jews. Sounds like any congregation in America. Isaac Toro, the Dutch, Dutch-born Chazan of the Newport congregation collaborated with the English as well. And after fleeing Newport, tells you something about what's going on, he goes to New York, he ultimately opts to move to Jamaica and lead the congregation there under the protection of the British authorities. All right, this is Isaac Toro. You may recognize the name of the synagogue. All right, it's named for his Chazan who had to flee because the people weren't happy with him. Also, somewhat <laughs> recognizable in American society. Needing financial support to move to Jamaica, he pens a letter and that is reading number two. The petition of Isaac Toro, late rector of the Jewish synagogue at Rhode Island, humbly showeth that from the distresses which your petitioner suffered from persecution for his attachment to his majesty's government, and coming to his majesty's troops from Rhode Island to this city of New York, he was so reduced in his circumstances that it had not, that had it not been for the humane interference of General William Tyrone, General John Marsh and other respectable persons, he might have sunk under the weight of his affliction and distress. That from their kind patronage, the bounty of government has been extended to him and he has made shift to support himself and family that the petitioner is now anxiously desirous of removing himself and family to the island of Jamaica, but is incompetent to defray the expenses of his passage, etc. That the only resource he has left to him is your, excellence, your Excellency's humanity and benevolence in the hope that you will grant him in advance of one 12 months allowance, which would effectively enable him to accomplish his, witnesses, his wishes. Your petitioner thereby humbly prays that your excellency will be favorably pleased to order a 12 month allowance to be paid to him to enable him to remove with his family to the island of Jamaica. And as is in duty bound, he will, ev he will ever pray. On and on and on. You can see they, they're appealing. They, they, there are some who are appealing to the British government for support. Families, just like in the Civil War, we'll see, the families themselves in majority were divided. David Franks was the king's sole agent in the Northern colonies that provided food and supplies to the British troops. But other family members, David Salisbury Franks and Isaac Franks served as officers in the Continental Army. When push comes to shove, there are about a Thousand, between 1,000 and 2,500 Jews in America at the time, the great majority, for reasons I'll lay out for you, ultimately support the revolution. Part of their support grows from economic profiles. American Jews, with few, few exceptions, made their livings as merchants. All right. Many of them signed pledges refusing to deal with the British in, in terms of good, British goods. Two, second, so they were merchants, that's number one. Number two, few of them had come from England and those who did were German and Polish Jews who had just been there very briefly. And so they had 
very little connection to England in general. They harbored few positive or patriotic sentiments towards England, its institutions, and its culture. So there really was no connection anyway. Three, the British weren't giving the Jews any rights of any kind of leadership position. And so the result is there was no danger for anyone of jeopardizing their positions. There's nothing to lose in so doing. And four, the one distinction that might have played out in the non-Jewish world, none had any reason to express loyalty to the Church of England, the religious arm of the imperial force. And so they had no real stake in the preservation of the status quo. Right? So they signed up with the revolution. They tended to portray their experience in the war as both personal and religious. They saw the divine hand working behind the scenes on the field of battle. It sounds great to us, but you realize, think about what that means in the world today. It's not, it's, it's not as wonderful as we'd like to portray. This helped them to make sense of the events transpiring around them, and it imbued their struggle with transcendent meaning. It cast them on a, on a sacred road to liberty. Again, when it's, your, when it's your way of life and it's what you want, it's a great idea. When it's not, it can be tragic. The theme of exile emerged as part of this as early as August 1776, when Gershom Sexus, the native-born Chazan of Congregation Sheriff Israel, led patriotic members of his congregation out of New York City in the face of British opposition. And over the objections of the Tories, Sexus took with him the Torah scrolls. He grabbed them and took them, a move likely justified by con security concerns. That's how he expressed it, but really carrying great symbolic, uh, symbolic meaning as well. They felt that if you have the Torah, you're gonna to be assured of justice. The ancient Israelites did the same thing. They took the ark with them into battle, if you read through the Bible, because that, that would assure victory. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So therefore I say you assurance, probably not. A little bit of a personal, add a little personal touch to this. The first Jew to die for American independence was ironically also the first Jew elected to public offices in the colonies. His name was Francis Salvador. Salvador was born into a wealthy Jewish family in London in 1747. 26 years later, a reversal of financial for fortune led him to, a fa to family owned land in South Carolina, where he joins the patriotic cause. In 1775, he's 28 years old, he's the first Jew elected to public office as a member of the Provincial Congress of South Carolina. July of 1776, again, we hear the song and then we know the year, in a reprisal attack against Cherokee Indians, Salvador was shot and scalped. The Indians didn't care if he were Jewish. Second, Mordechai Sheftel of Savannah, Georgia, was the head of the local revolutionary committee and was responsible for the provisions provided the soldiers. In 1778, he was appointed Deputy, Deputy Commissioner, Commissary General, it's easy for me to say, for federal troops. But before the Congress could approve, it, approve that appointment, the British captured him and imprisoned him and his son. A third, Robert Edding of Baltimore, enlisted the moment he heard about the Battle of Lexington and he headed north to Massachusetts. He's taken prisoner by the British, who, discovering he is Jewish, give him nothing other than pork to eat, which he refuses to eat. He's able for a period of time to survive on the scraps of food permitted from fellow prisoners. But he ultimately is so weakened by this that he dies shortly after his release. And just so we know the women were involved too. Abigail Minnis supplied provisions to American troops in 1779, angering the British authorities. She receives permission from them, however, to move with her daughters to safety in Charleston, South Carolina. Now this is, 17, this is in the 1780s, 
She dies at 1794 at the age of 94. Good for her. Good for her. All right, let's talk a little bit about the financial implications of what goes on in the war. The war inflicts great hardship on both communities and individuals. Many Jewish merchants, again, that was their primary field, suffered dislocations and reverses, and many personal fortunes disappeared as merchants found their trade interrupted in COVID. Not, not hard to understand. Chaim Solomon, later to gain fame as a mythical Jewish financier of the revolution, began the war as a wealthy merchant whose unstinting financial support helped to keep the revolution going. Solomon, a Polish-born financial broker, arrives in New York on the eve of the revolution and immediately involves himself with the radical Sons of Liberty. Imprisoned by the British after they occupied the city in 1776, he manages to escape, only to be rearrested for active support of rebellion against the crown. One more time, he escapes. After he had suffered intense uh, suffering, he makes his way to Philadelphia, where he plays a crucial role in selling the bonds and bills of exchange that kept the infant republic alive and afloat. At the end of the eight years of toil and turbulence, the struggle for independence had broken his health, both physically and financially, and he dies penniless from tuberculosis two years after the war ends. Like any good, good historical event, Midrashim developed, there's a legend, a legend that the design process of the Great Seal, that when they were doing this design process, Washington asked what compensation Solomon would want in return for his contributions to the American Revolution. And Solomon replied again, this is Midrash, he wanted nothing for himself, but he wanted something for his people. There's no evidence of any of this. But there's a theory that the 13 stars representing the colonies on the seal were arranged in the shape of a Star of David in commemoration of Solomon's contributions. Midrash, please understand that, has little basis in thought, even though it's often repeated. In, in fact, in 1893, however, this is true, a bill was presented before the 52nd United States Congress ordering that a gold medal be struck in recognition of Solomon's contributions to the United States. So his contributions were real. How are, how, what, what, what ways of honoring him? There's some truth, there's some midrash. British attacks forced residents from their homes, including the Jews, from the cities of Newport, from Philadelphia, from Boston, from Charlotte, Charleston, of the approximately 1,500 Jews that were scattered among the 13 colonies on the American Revolution, about 200 of them lived in Newport. That's a significant number. It's the largest concentration of Jews in the colonies. Aaron Lopez, I mentioned his name last week. He was the financier of that first synagogue. He laid the cornerstone. He was one of the Newport Jews who opposed British rule, and he abandons the city where they had developed roots and prospered. He leads his extended family and members of two other families, numbering nearly 79 people to temporary settlements in Massachusetts. So Newport is really, as I described yesterday, is disappearing as a Jewish colonial influence. While the revolution the successful revolution, thank God, does not ultimately usher in a messianic age for American Jews. It does affect changes in the law and in the relationship of religion to the state that transformed American Jewish lives forever. New York, with its long tradition of de facto religious pluralism, became in 1777 the first state to extend the boundaries of free exercise and enjoyment of religious profession and worship to all of mankind, whether Christian or not, 1777. Virginia, 
in an act in 1785, has an act for religious freedom and goes even further with a ringing declaration that says, reading number three, no man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship, place, or ministry whatsoever, but that all men shall be free to profess and by argument to maintain their opinions in matters of religion, and the same shall in no wise diminish, enlarge, or affect their civil capacities. Powerful statement. The Constitution, 1787, the Bill of Rights, 1791, outlaws religious tests. It says as a, a test cannot be given as a qualification to any office of public trust under the United States. And it forbids Congress, as well you know, from making any law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We are so accustomed to that just being the way of life. It is not. We are so blessed. The Constitution and the, and the First Amendment made the U.S. the first country in nearly 2,000 years to guarantee Jewish res residents full citizenship. It is a rarity. July 4th, 1788, a procession com commemorating the ratification of the Constitution, the Philadelphia rabbi, Jacob Cohn walks between two Christian ministers to show that the new republic was founded on religious toleration. We wouldn't think twice in those days, they did. Following the parade, kosher food was served on a separate table at the reception, permitting Jews to enjoy the festivities with their Christian neighbors. A year later, when George Washington was ignored, igno inaugurated at the first, as the first president, Reverend Sexton, Gershom Mendes Sexus, was one of the 14 clergymen who participated in that festival. Uh, any comments, questions? Yes, no? One, one of the difficulties of online is it just, it does inhibit this, the interplay, and I apologize. I wish I, I, wish I had a magic answer to that one. After the war, some Jews do report, return to Newport, but by then the fortunes of this port had declined. The Jews who had increased Philadelphia's population during the war, many of them returned to New York, leaving Mikvah Israel, the Philadelphia synagogue, financially troubled. Indeed, the remaining members made a community-wide appeal in 1788 for funds to keep the congregation alive and among the, the, the subscribers for that, for that request, we find is Benjamin Franklin, who is recorded as having donated five pounds to the cause. Yay, Benjamin. There's still concerns. One can have legal freedom and at the same time be persecuted. We know we have legal freedoms in America doesn't mean every Jew has a wonderful day every day, all right? Nonetheless, on a public level, for the first time, as I said to you, in almost 2,000 years, things have changed. In New York, the leaders of Sheriff Israel, who returned to the city after the British withdrawal, <coughs> addressed a letter, a letter to Governor George Clinton, pledging loyalty on behalf of the ancient congregations of Israel. Reading number four, this is his letter. We, the members of the ancient congregation of Israelites, lately returned from exile, beg leave to welcome your arrival in the city with our most cordial congratulations. Society we believe to, society we belong to is but small when compared with other religious societies, yet we flatter ourselves that none have manifested a more zealous attachment to the sacred cause of American, America in the war with Great Britain. We derive therefore the highest satisfaction from reflecting that it, is, that it is pleased the almighty arbiter of events to dispose us to take part with the country we live in. And we now look forward with pleasure to the happy days we expect to enjoy under the constitution, wisely framed to preserve 
the estimable blessing of civil and religious liberty. Taught by the divine legislator to obey our rulers and prompted there, therefore to buy the dictates of our own reason, it will be the anxious endeavor of the members of our current congregation to render themselves worthy of these blessings by discharging the duties of good citizens. Now this is, as I said, um, in very, very early after the war, you almost can hear the answer to Napoleon's question to the French Jews, do you have loyalty to the country? You can almost hear it being echoed in those words. The leaders of all the Jewish congregations in the United States decided to create a single letter of congratulations to the new elected president, newly elected president, George Washington. It was Washington's response in 1790 to the Jewish congregation of Newport that became the iconic affirmation of acceptance by successive generations of American Jews. And that is reading number five. These are George Washington's words. The citizens of the United States of America have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy a policy worthy of initiation, imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it was the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the govern government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution, no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. <clears throat> it, was inc it would be inconsistent with the frankness of my character not to avow that I am pleased with your favorable opinion of my administration and fervent wishes for my felicity. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and to enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, you hear the biblical references, and there shall be none to make him afraid. May the father of all mercies scatter light and not darkness in our path and make us all in our several vocations useful here and in his own due time and way everlastingly happy, George Washington. Those words were really an official welcome from the first president of the United States. That support among presidents continued. Our second president, John Adams, in a letter to our third president, John Thomas Jefferson wrote, reading six, I will insist that the Hebrews have done more to civilize man than any other nation. Fate has ordained the Jews to be the most essential instrument for civilization. Now that's an endorsement. In an 1808 letter, criticizing the depiction of Jews by the French enlightened philosopher Voltaire, Adam, Adams expresses his respect for ancient Jewry, reading number seven, Adams wrote of Voltaire, how is it possible that he should represent the Hebrews in such a contemptible light? They are the most glorious nation that ever inhabited this earth. The Romans and their empire were but a bubble in comparison of the Jews. They have given religion to three quarters of the globe and have influenced the affairs of mankind more and more happily than any nation, ancient or modern. We like John Adams. Thomas Jefferson is deservedly a hero to American Jewry, furthering US equal rights. Jefferson wrote a bill for establishing religious freedom in Virginia in 1776. And it's a classic example of religious toleration. The bill, which the Virginia legislator unfortunately uh, defeated, would have allowed the naturalization of Jews, Catholics, and other non-Protestants as Virginia's citizens. During the debate, Jefferson quoted John Locke's argument that neither pagan 
nor Mohammedan, nor Jew ought to be excluded from the civil rights of the Commonwealth because of his religion. <coughs> Excuse me. It's important to note, it's not that, that Jefferson per se was you know, this lover of Jews. He didn't do this out of respect for Judaism per se, but because he respected the right of every individual to hold whatever faith they in particular bought. By the end of the 18th century, no more than 3,000 Jews were living in this country, more than half of them down south. For the most part, they continued to immerse themselves in all that American life had to offer. One reason for the low population rate was the small number of Jewish immigrants. But a second reason was an alarming rate of intermarriage and conversion. Welcome to freedom. With the purchase of the Louisiana territory in 1803, you have the expanding boundaries of a new country and that does draw many Ashkenazim to this part of the world. And they help found cities like St. Louis, Nashville, Detroit, and Cincinnati. That's where I'm gonna stop for today. We'll continue next week um, with this, I, but I'm open to questions. First of all, I do wanna suggest, I think Barbara wrote me a note this week suggesting that if people have other resources or materials that they'd like to share, if you have, for example, you found a reading online, you're welcome to put it in the chat box on here for other people to go searching for because there's, there's an unlimited amount of material that's out there. That's the good news. We're, we're talking about the last 250 years, not, not 2,500 years. And so you can find a lot of material out there. You're welcome to share with one another in this process. Questions? I have one. Yes. Whom are you recognizing? Uh, Barbara, I hear your voice. Okay, well, my chat doesn't work, unfortunately. So I couldn't put anything in there. But I, I going back to colonial times uh, and early uh, USA, um, with regard to the congregations, and even though there was uh, differences among them, the few that existed, uh, they still had to perform rite of circumcision. And so who were the uh, people they had to, I assume, is share the skill of somebody with regard to that, and also with regard to mikvah. Weren't they compelled to provide mikvah uh, with their congregations? I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so I, I have to imagine that, you know, in today's, you don't need a rabbi to go to the mikvah. Right. First. You don't need a rabbi to, to, to be circumcised, okay? And so there were probably specialists who existed that may not have had a, a large expanse of Jewish knowledge, but had the knowledge specific tasks that they were being asked to do. All right. I, I don't know if that answers your question. I don't know who they were specifically. I can't name them per se, but I have to imagine that, the, they, that they, they did figure out how to do that. Now, whether or not those circumstances, for example, were halakhically uh, fulfilling, I can't even begin to answer that question, okay? That it happened, yes. That they probably were a lot more uh, open in, in understanding in the same way they had to be with Kashrut and everything else is probably a fact. Can I uh, make a comment? Please, Cynthia. Okay, so... Um... It, just uh, just going back to um, how open this area was to uh, allowing Jews, in uh, the 1660s, when the Carolinas were awarded to Lord Anthony Ashley Cooper by Charles II, mm -hmm. Ashley Cooper asked his secretary, John Locke, to write a constitution, and he puts together something called the Fundamental Constitution of the Carolinas. There is a state in that constitution which uh, says that all are welcome here, including Jews, heathens, and other dissidents. And as I've always liked to say, as politically incorrect as that might sound today, in fact, that opens up this the Carolinas, which extends okay. down to Florida to Virginia, to freedom for the Jews. 
the, the constitution itself was never accepted as a true constitution for the area, but that, that statement really has an impact on the area and the settlement of the Jews. A lot of the Jews coming from the Caribbean area into the Carolinas, Savannah, well, Georgia, Savannah and Charleston areas. All right, so just to summarize, because I know people here can't hear, that there were documents that were being created in the words of John Locke, which enabled the communities of the Carolinas in particular, even when in a sense they classified Jews as dissidents in process, nonetheless opened the doors by in so doing for those communities. Is that a fair statement? But only different, the, the dissidents, Jews were actually separated from dissidents. The dissidents were the dissidents to the Church of England that they hoped would eventually become part of the Church of England and the heathens uh, were indigenous people. So dissidents there is being used in a specific way as those no, who are rejecting yeah. the Church of England. Right, and okay. Jews were, set, were distinctly mentioned. Right, fair enough. Anybody else? All right, my friends, a good week, stay healthy. Let's come back and play again next week. All right, be well. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for a great uh, class. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got to I'm trying to turn it off. It's not doing anything for me.